This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula, where you can catch it ad-free and with some extras. Hello, I'm Soph, these are my notes, and today I'm going to be talking about next generation sequencing, aka NGS, aka the way that we suss out DNA sequences, and importantly, I'm going to discuss how it may potentially revolutionise certain areas of medicine, in particular cancer treatment. Show my squad, not got time to dry. <laughs> Next generation sequencing is a method used to sequence DNA strands. Now your DNA is made up of a combination of four bases and sequencing just means that we're working out what order or sequence those bases come in. The order of these bases determines what genes you have, your genes determine what proteins are made in your body and proteins are just little things that your body is full of that control how it works. Ergo sum, your DNA sequence broadly controls how your body works. It's a little bit more complicated than that, please Please don't come at me in the comments, poor favor. Knowing what your DNA sequence is allows us to see if you're at risk of developing certain diseases or if you're at risk of passing them on to your kids, and it also could help us to define what may have caused a disease that you already have. But working out someone's DNA sequence in order to get a better genetic picture of them isn't actually anything new, but what has changed is the speed at which that can happen. The way we did this before NGS was a process called Sanger sequencing. This is the method that was used to sequence the first ever human genome, i.e. to find the order of all the bases along a full two meters of a person's DNA. But Sanger sequencing is pretty slow, and that process to find that first human genome took 12 years. A kid born when the scientists began doing that would have pretty much reached puberty by the time they finished. It took one childhood to sequence a whole human genome. I mean, your childhood isn't over when you're 12, obviously, but you get my point. <laughs> and so this is where NGS steps up to the plate. NGS is basically Sanger sequencing on speed. I'll explain a little bit more about how it works scientifically in a moment, but basically where Sanger sequencing involved reading the sequence of one tiny fragment of DNA at a time, NGS reads millions at once. This is why NGS is also known sometimes as shotgun sequencing or massively parallel sequencing or high throughput sequencing. The shotgun part comes from the fact that we split the DNA into tons of tiny little mini fragments that we read all at once and the other two highlight what is special about NGS, that you can analyze all these sequences in parallel, i.e. at the same time. And it makes sense to give NGS a new name because it's not in the NG, the next generation anymore. It's in this one. The development of NGS has meant that already the average cost of finding the sequence for someone's whole genetic code has gone down in the last couple of decades from a hundred million dollars to under a thousand dollars. And the time it's taken has gone down from about 12 years to about a day. <laughs> And that's to sequence a whole genome. You don't even need to do that. You can select for particular genes if you want, which is cheaper and takes even less time. This is absolutely wild, this like time and cost cut, and it has huge implications for the world of treatment and diagnostics. Before I get onto that though, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown of what actually happens scientifically when we sequence DNA. And my plan for this video is to cut it into chapters. So I'll give you a moment to skip past this if you want to. Five, one, three, eight, zero, zero, eight. <laughs> All right, nerds, you're here to hear some science. While you are here, why not click on the little subscribe button and the bell to hear when you can come here to hear more science. Sweet. NGS is actually a broad title that covers any kind of post Sanger or after Sanger sequencing methods where lots of bits of DNA are sequenced at once. So within kind of each stage of the DNA sequencing process, there's a bit of space for variation. But in general, we have four key stages, which you can remember with the handy acronym of CASA. CASA stands for construct, amplify, sequencing, and analysis, that's it. Me sequencing, it to sequencing. The C, construct, is where you make your DNA library for sequencing. This library is what the sequencer will read. They love a book analogy in genomics. This DNA library could come from a blood sample or some spit, for example, sample example. Before it can be analyzed, as I've said, long strands of DNA need to be cut into smaller chunks because they're easier to analyze. This DNA chopping can be done in different ways, including physically breaking the DNA apart or getting an enzyme to do it. Once we've chopped up our DNA, we put all of the fragments on a slide. A slide being a sheet of glass, not a downwards pointing tube. <laughs> 
each DNA fragment has its own place on the slide. So you end up with this piece of glass that has little bits of DNA dotted around it. Next comes A, where we are amplifying our sample. And that just means we clone each fragment. That means that each dot on the glass doesn't just have one bit of DNA on it, but in each place, there's a little pile of DNAs that all have the same sequence. As I said earlier, DNA is made of two strands. And at the end of this process, there's only one strand of each bit left. So picture the scene, glass slide on each little spot. There are tons of little single stranded DNAs, all with the same sequence, waving about like a waggy waving inflatable arm waving tube man. Apparently that's a reference that I should have put in there. Family Guy is it? The stage is now set for our next step. S for sequencing. Oh, we're finally here. There are a few different ways to sequence a genome, but arguably the most common method is one called sequencing by synthesis. This is the method used by one of the most popular sequencing machines, the Illumina sequencer. So it's the one that I'm gonna hone in on. As I said earlier, your DNA is made up of four different bases and they are represented, as I didn't say earlier, by the letters A, C, G, and T. I also said that our DNA is made up of two strands and these strands are complementary to each other, which just means that each base has one that it will always pair up with on the other side. So A will always pair up with T and C will always pair up with G. If you get your little gray cells working, that means that you only need one strand of the DNA to know what the other one is going to look like. That was my Poirot voice, if you can tell. So if I have a strand that has the code CAT or CAT, then I know that the strand opposite it will have a G because that's complementary to C, and then a T because that's complementary to A, and then an A because that's complementary to the T. So the strand that is complementary to CAT, C-A-T, is G-T-A. This key fact of genetics is what allows us to do our sequencing. Remember, we have our glass slide and at each place on this slide is a different bunch of single-stranded DNAs. So let's say our first spot is a bunch of cats. What a sequencing machine does is it washes over a solution that contains loads of free bases, which just means it's a solution full of A's, G's, C's and T's that are just floating about on their own looking for some DNA. DNA to pair up with. Each base letter has a different fluorescent label attached to it. Now these free bases can't just pair up with our DNA willy-nilly, they have to pair up in the order the strand goes in. So in this case, C is the first base in our cat DNA sequence, so G will be the first free base to match up with it. Let's say in this case, G is labelled with the colour green, easy to remember. When a free G attaches to a DNA strand that's on the slide, then some green light will come from that spot and it will be detected by the sequencer. This is why we had that amplification or cloning step, because a load of green light coming from a little bunch in one go is way more likely to be read by the sequencer than one lonely DNA strand being like, green. That green light is red and then recorded into the system and then the whole process is done again. The solution was washed over the slide once more. This time it'll be the A in our cat that is looking for a bonding partner, which will be T. Let's say that we've labelled T with a blue light signal, so the sequencer will read blue light coming from this bunch of T's in this spot and that'll be marked as being the next letter in the sequence. Repeat this for as long as you need, for as long as your DNA strand is, and boom, you've got a full sequence coded for by little, little lights. Now as I said, on our glass slide we have loads of fragments where this is being done at the same time. So for each round of free base washing, the sequencing machine is getting tons of input from all these little fluorescent dots, and that is what allows NGS to have its massively parallel ability. The machine reads all of the colours and therefore all of the sequences in one go, building up the fragments one base at a time. Do you not think that is so, so smart? I think it's absolutely wild. and. It looks really nice, which is always a benefit. This little slide with all these little fluorescent lights going off on it. All that's left in at this point is the A in our CASA, and that is for analyzing our sequence. Maybe it'll be down here, A. <laughs> Depending on what DNA you're sequencing and what you want to find out, the analysis stage will involve different processes yet again. However, a key part of it, whatever your mission is, is to piece together all the fragments you have back into the original full strand of DNA that you wanted to sequence, be that a full genome or just one gene. FYI, the fact that you have to chop up your DNA into relatively small chunks is actually one of the biggest limitations of NGS. If a new technology was created where you could sequence 
as long a strand of you wanted in one go, then that would probably be the next big pioneer of genomics. You heard it here. Misjudged where my armrest was, but still. After you've pieced your genome together, which isn't an error-free process by the way, it can be a bit difficult, then you can do whatever analysis you need to do. May I recommend that a good place to start if you're looking for mutated genes that might be causing disease is comparing your sequence to what is called a reference genome. A reference genome is like an average genome taken from analysis of other people's genetic code and we can compare the sequences we found against them to see if we can spot anything unusual and or suspicious. And there we go, that's a stop tour of what genetic sequencing is. For those of you who made it through the science and those of you who skipped, don't worry, you're all equal to me. Now it's time to talk about why this tech is so exciting and potentially revolutionary for medicine and diagnostics. And then it's time to have a little bit of balance by mentioning some of the potential limitations. Starting with the excitations then. As mentioned earlier, the development of NGS and the way that it's reduced the cost and the time taken for genetic testing and analysis has acted as rocket fuel basically for various different areas of research. I'm going to talk about how NGS is helping the world of gut bacteria research or microbiome research in my Nebula exclusive version of this video, but in this video I'm going to skip that and go straight on to talking about cancer treatment. Because cancer research is a huge area where this tech seems to be having a pretty positive effect. Cancer is a disease caused by mutations in your DNA. I've talked about it in way more detail in my video about why it's so hard to find a cure for, but basically there's a huge range of mutations that can cause different cancers. And a single cancer can pick up a combination of different mutations in a kind of pick a mix, and there can even be multiple different mutations in different areas of a single cancer. In certain cases, the DNA mutations a cancer has can determine which treatments may work and which treatments may not work. This means that in some cases, having the ability to sequence the genome of someone's cancer cells can inform doctors of which treatments they should try and which ones they shouldn't bother with. One really interesting example is this. There's a mutation that often occurs in colorectal cancers and it's a mutation in the gene EGFR. If a cancer has that mutation, then it's likely a certain treatment will work on it. But if those cells also have a mutation in a gene called KRAS, then that same treatment will not work. That's just one example of how being able to sequence someone's genome may mean we save precious time that otherwise could have been wasted trying out treatments that ended up not working. There are projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas which have attempted to find more examples like this by characterizing tumors from thousands of different patients. And ultimately, projects like that have acted as a catalyst for the world of personalized medicine in cancer. I've mentioned how I used to dream when I was in uni of a world of personalized treatment for each individual with cancer. And at the time, everyone was like, get on your bike, that's a joke. But now, that's a bit more likely. NGS is able to help us to get there. Although for a bit of realism, at the moment, less than a quarter of cancer patients benefit from one of these personalized treatment findings. So there's a little bit of a way to go there. But NGS technology has the potential to help us increase that proportion further. Okay, so I kind of toe dipped myself into the world of limitations there with that one quarter stat. So let's talk about it. The limitations of NGS, the reasons that we might need to hold our horses. The main limitation of NGS that I want to discuss is that sequencing information is only as good as the data that we have on the genes that we sequence. To bring that sort of timeline of how DNA ultimately impacts your body from earlier, we may know it's an unusual DNA sequence, but if we don't know how that impacts any of the knock-on parts, then it may not be necessarily useful information. For example, there's a mutation known as the ApoE4 mutation that is thought to have some connection to Alzheimer's development, but we don't know how. Not least because we still haven't decided what actually causes Alzheimer's. We don't really know. There's a few competing theories. And even if we did know exactly how ApoE4 connected to Alzheimer's, we still have no way of treating it. So for a personal point of view, if your DNA was sequenced, is finding out you have the ApoE4 mutation even useful? And what if you worried about having it for years and tried to do things to prevent you getting Alzheimer's and then more research came out and it emerged that ApoE4 isn't actually that important in Alzheimer's because that sometimes happens with research. To kind of hark back to me worrying about people coming for me in the comments earlier, 
Your body is really complicated and there's way more to things than just your DNA sequence. There's so many interactions beyond the sequence that are really important that sequencing data doesn't necessarily tell us. That's not to say sequencing data isn't useful. It is useful and it can be useful and it may help us to unpack these things further down the line. But in terms of disease diagnosis and understanding, there's a lot more information we need than just a list of potentially troublesome mutations. This brings me on to my next thing, which is that direct-to-consumer testing can be a bit of a problem. Because NGS tech is becoming so cheap, companies are popping up everywhere that will sequence your genome for you to find out different things about yourself. It's developing into a really big business. However, these companies really need to be careful to ensure that they offer appropriate information and support to their customers, both before and after the process. Do their clients know what they're getting into? And then after they get the results, do they know what it all means? Do they know what having a risk gene means? How solid is the research out there on said risk gene? Has it shown a, a causal link or is it just a correlation? <laughs> Sequencing knowledge is not power without context. The this information is only as good as the data we have on the genes thing is important also in terms of where we're getting our genetic data from. In short, there is a huge skew towards sequencing data in people with European ancestry. This means that drugs built around this genetic information may not have the same effects for those from other ancestral backgrounds and genetic diagnoses may be more likely to give us false results. If if you want to find out more, you can look up the work of Deep Deco Dazani, who's sequencing the DNA from thousands of people from underrepresented backgrounds with an aim to bring context to pre-existing findings and also to potentially highlight new gene variations associated with diseases that we hadn't found before. In terms of other limitations, there's also some workflow problems and some big data security questions, which I'm not going to talk about here, but I do talk about in my extended Nebula version of this video. Nebula, by the way, is a streaming video service that's become a bit of a haven for educational creators who don't want to worry about the dreaded YouTube algorithm. On YouTube, you get punished, basically, if people don't watch your content for long enough. That's why I've tried to keep this as sleek as possible, believe it or not. Whereas Nebula is a site that's been created created by other educational YouTubers specifically as a place where we can try out new things without the algo looming over us. There's loads of us on there, including creators who I really look up to, not just literally, um, and we're posting videos on there without sponsor ads, and more and more of us are starting to do extended versions. So in this version of my video on Nebula, right now I'm talking about what NGS and GME, aka Game Stonks, have in common. All these investment YouTubers are like, yes, I know about CRISPR, I totally understand. As already said, I fitted in some chat too about keeping your genetic data safe and sussing out the bacteria in your gut. And there's also totally original content that you can't get anywhere on YouTube too, like me saying why I love the Pokemon theme song so much, or me competing for money in a game show hosted by Tom Scott. But there's even more because us at Nebula, we at Nebula, we've partnered up with a streaming giant, you know the one, Curiosity Stream. On Curiosity Stream, you can get access to thousands of documents entries on all sorts of topics. If this video has piqued your interest in genetics, then why not watch The Genetics Revolution, which delves into the world of genetic engineering and gene editing. Shout out to CRISPR, which I've made videos on before and probably will again. We've set up a deal where if you sign up to my link, you can get access to Nebula for free the whole time you're signed up to Curiosity Stream. But how much does it cost to sign up to Curiosity Stream? Well, with our discount, that's less than $15 a year. In British pounds, that's less than than a tenner. I literally spent more than that on a single pizza last night, genuinely. So if you want to support educational creators, have access to tons of documentaries and exclusive content, then sign up by going to curiositystream.com slash sofsnotes. I repeat, there you can get a year's access to both CuriosityStream and Nebula for $14.79. The link's in the description and honestly, signing up really helps me and my educational brethren out. <laughs> Despite the limitations I've mentioned, NGS is an extremely exciting technology that researchers and clinicians are genuinely buzzing about. And it's quite rare to have scientists, who are generally taught to be quite wary and cynical, be openly excited about the potential of something to change the face of their field. But when researching NGS, it really feels like it could revolutionise diagnostics and treatment in certain areas like cancer. Just imagine if a patient
patient at home could send off a self-collected blood sample and then get a whole genetic profile back. It would be wild. We just have to be careful about how we collect, store and interpret the information. And it's always worth keeping an eye out for the NNGS, the next next generation sequencing methodology. As I said in the science section, NGS is limited in that we have to chop our DNA fragments and then piece them back together. Working out a way to sequence a single DNA strand without doing that chopping part could signal the next big genetics revolution. So keep an eye out for it. That's it for now though everyone, do drop a comment below on your thoughts about getting your genome sequenced. Would you pay to get it done from like an external company? Would you want to find out all your potential risk mutations even if there was nothing you could do? I'm interested to know. Otherwise like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe it if you subscribe it and media my socials if you want to do that. All that's left to say then is thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day and keep watching for the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> a massive thank you to my wonderful patrons with a special science word shout out to Drove Singal and Brent, Justin, Adam and Terry. Shade. In fact, it the next next generation technology. How many books can I add successfully? How many books can I add? Oh. <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? This is fun. Bye bye to the main video. And that's the end. Here's the video I mentioned about why cancer is so hard to find a cure for. And here is a playlist of some of my faves. And below is a little cheeky Patreon link. Bye.